what's fascinated me about you is, you know, I think I kind of came on to with the whole black guns matter, um, movement. But when I started to research you and listen a little bit more, what I found was so many other things within the organization that you guys are doing, um, everything from helping people with financial solvency, having, uh, helping people with understanding their health and their, their, uh, their wellness, uh, taking care of their bodies, their relationships. This is, I think there's a psychological and emotional component there. Uh, there's also, uh, up in, doesn't, it's no surprise. There's a political activism piece in terms of helping people be educated and feel confident so that they can have articulate conversations about these difficult, uh, and, and often, you know, I guess very touchy subjects. Can you talk a little bit more about sort of the, just kind of the, the combination of things that you're doing for your community and how it works? Well, we can teach like a beginner. That's not hard. Line the sites up, pull the trigger backwards mm -hmm. without disturbing the site picture. That's not, I can do that in 30 minutes. Um, but to give someone that has been, because most of our work, I don't know if I mentioned it, is in urban America. It's mostly in black cities. And that does not mean, that's not sent to, said to disparage different ethnic groups in America. It's said to like, yo, this is where the problem is. Gun control was started to make sure that black people did not have the means to defend themselves. So, you know, you go where the, the work is needed the most. Um, but in teaching a beginner how to how to do that. OK, now what if you teach, you know, one of my good friends, KD, he runs no other choice firearm training down in uh, he's in Atlanta now. He's from St. Louis. He has a phrase that I use very often. He says, um, you know, a firearm is to defend the equity that you've built up in your life. Oh, that I love that. You know what I'm saying? And so I'm just like, if the person doesn't feel like they even have any equity mm -hmm. in their life, it could potentially be a different disaster. So what about, you know, and then I talked to, you know, I, I literally talked to my friend I killed today. He's, you know, a uh, drill sergeant major and, and sniper and Green Beret and special forces, all of that legit dude squared away. Um, but he, we talk about this all of the time, you know, he's a paramedic now and he's like, bro, teaching people quality of life stuff and how to protect life. They'll use, they'll use that stuff way more in their everyday life than, you know, most of us never use our firearm in a self-defensive situation and, and, and rightfully so. Yeah. And so like teaching a group of people that beginners, young people, especially about, yo, this is the things that we're taking away from these public schools where we live. Can we re-implement that without government involvement? Then you help that person build up the equity in their life and not on some like they need my help because they're incapable. They need resources. And we know that the system designed it to remove those things from like home economics and shop used to be taught in schools. Man, they start taking that stuff out. I remember when I was in high school. All we did was just replace the things that would allow a person to develop different skill sets to build the equity in their house or their life, you know, their, their property, right? Increasing their property values, for lack of a better term. And so that's what, that was the reason why when we got off the tour going around the country with the firearms component, obviously we still teach firearms classes. I'm at the range three, four times a week. However, um, it's also because we have this building, now we can give people, you know, all right. types of opportunities for free. And then if people like have this knowledge and don't have a venue, yo, come teach your class and the exchanges, the days that you teach your own classes, you charge for those, right? You put something towards the house, but generally it's free. I just want the people to get the knowledge for free, but at the same time, there's individuals volunteering to assist towards the collective. So it's not collectivism, it's I choose to pay it forward to help a community and then that that group of people then start to become stronger defenders of individual rights. So it's like yin and yang, really. And so I love how you brought that up, that that term of collectivism is if it sounds like you've been attacked before for potentially uh, driving that that type of a, of an organization. And it, it doesn't sound like collectivism at, at all to me. Like I have a gym here. Right. We're constantly bringing people in from the outside to uh bring education to both our clients and the, the local coaches community, or even, uh, you know, like practitioner community or whatever. And if, if, if you weren't doing, if you weren't talking about firearms, right. And if you weren't talking about education, uh, like we do, like it, it, we don't do that here. We would never be accused of collectivism. 
right? But because of the subject matter that you're bringing to the table, uh, it people tend to tend to tend to drift off course. I think it's that, and because I say black, because I say gun control is racist. It targeted the community that I happen to be from and live in. And we have to change that. That does, again, that doesn't mean we like, you, you ever see that uh, family guy meme where the dude's like standing there with like different shades of person. And it's like, if you're this color, you can't get in. It's like, it's one of my favorite, it's one of my favorite shows. Secretly, it's one of my favorite shows. Uh, <laughs> and it's like, no, we're saying that this demographic and clearly we see it. And it's, it's unfortunately, it's also, yeah. you know, Democrat cities. But it's like, yo, we got to be honest about that. And so because we say it that way, never mind that a lot of our instructors happen to be white or Arab or, or Asian or women or whatever, right? Or black. The, the collectivist thing is sprung because, you know, sometimes in the conservative or what's being presented as conservative lately, the conservative and libertarian room, we understand the importance of individual sovereignty but sometimes that becomes like a, a inability for a person to be nuanced. If I'm saying, mm -hmm. you know, if I, if I move to, you know, like Calabasas, Calabasas is going to be like predominantly white, right? Yep. I was just there. I'm going to be, if I move in that community and I'm doing work in that community, I'm going to talk about white issues, the issues that the white people in that community are impacted by. It, it makes sense. That's not offensive. It's not offensive to me. It's not offensive to me. The, the the collectivist thing is because usually when black people say it, sometimes because extreme leftists try to push this white guilt thing, conservatives on this side like overcorrect and like go, well, we can't just we're, we're all American. It's like, duh, America's a salad. There's like croutons. There's like tomatoes. <laughs> there's like, you know, lettuce. They are different flavors and different vegetables in this salad. And if we just respect each thing, we'll have a beautiful salad. Right. And so sometimes, and I understand why, um, you know, the BLM, the Antifa energy makes it seem as if um, if you say, hey, I'm going to work in the black community that I live in. It's like this collectivist separatist type of situation. And that's not my thing. Um, America is, and I, you know, I did a, a podcast where he was saying like, it's not a melting pot, melting pots, everything blends in together. And it's, it's one, it's not any difference. That's why to me, it's a salad. It's a good, it's a good analogy, man. I mean, we're all, we're, we're all different. It's, we're not going to be melded together. It's just, I got to do the work where I live and I got to do the work where it's needed the most. If in a hundred years, if I'm still alive and it's switched and all of the guns is in the black community and the second amendment is there and suburban and rural America is like super anti-gun attack, then we'll switch again. And that's where I'm going to go do the work. So you just got to go, you know, it's like clearing a house, bro. We looking for work. You know what I'm saying? Where, where yep. we could go to get the work done is where we going to go. Yeah. There are needs out there and you're, and you're filling gaps and uh, it's to be commended. I wonder if you can maybe talk a little bit about the people that are coming to see you, like who's coming into the center. I mean, you talked about some of the different things that you do, but Who's the public, man? Who's who's walking in there? What kind of questions are they asking? Are they like, what is this man? Like, I really don't know. Like, should I be involved? They, is it tenuous or are they like, dude, I saw you on Instagram and I got to I'm all in. So let's go. What? It's, a, it's a little bit of both. The community initially, because our building, even though it's right on the corner, it kind of looks like. Like almost like remember a men in black where they, all of the guys would go in and it's just like a, a empty building. Yeah. <laughs> like it's like, yo, what is yeah. in here? Yeah. Um, yeah. And so we get that because people if I open the doors and like play music, people will go like and they'll see like cert pistols on a table and they like, what, what is this? So that helps. Or one sometimes we'll have the yoga mats for yoga classes on the floor. And we got Nag Champa incense burning inside and out. And people are like, yo, what? It's such an eclectic mix of things that it spurs their curiosity. Some people come to the classes because they just want to chop it up with me. They're like, yo, I, I saw you on this show. I saw you on right. that, um, which is a good thing. It's, it also reminds me to be vigilant in my safety. You know, um, the reality is, you know, like our good brother Nipsey Hussle was trying to do some good stuff in his community after he turned his life around. And uh, he was murdered in front of his location. So it, it makes me stay on point. Um, but generally, it's curious people that want to come learn. As far as the gun classes, it's all beginners. 
it's all beginners. I, like it's it's we've adopted the planet fitness model. It's like, bro, we just just show up. I can relate. Yeah. We know you're not a bodybuilder yet. You may get there. But um, yo, you might you might still eat pizza. Cool. We have some if you want it. <laughs> if you're in there and you want to keep working out, you're not going to eat pizza as much. You're not going to eat donuts as much. It's just what's going to naturally happen. We just want you to come in the door. And so because we took that approach it, for four years, for four or five years, um, people know that there's no judgment. We are literally the no judgment zone. It's like I see so many I, I've trained with, learned from and, you know, got information uh, from whether direct or indirect, some very highly trained men and men and women. Um, <clears throat> like some of my friends are competition shooters, people like three gun Beth. Right. You no, know, they like switching platforms that fast and being consistent at it is a skill. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Daniel Horner is arguably like the best shooter like ever. I can talk to Daniel Horner and get tips. So I've learned from all of these different people, but the better instructors are the people that um, know how to make it very simple for beginners. Mm -hmm. There's a connection to the person and what it is, what it is they need in the moment. Yeah. Yep. I fortunately get a bunch of aha moments with beginners, a bunch of them. When we're going to a, a, a great example of that is um, when we're going over um, slack in a firearm, um, I got a, Serpus right here. When we're going over Slack, right? When we're, everybody, this is a cert pistol. Um, shouts to Next Level Training for hooking us up with these. Um, if you guys use promo code BGM, you'll get 10 That <laughs> Atta boy. That a boy. <laughs> slack. So when we're going over Slack and I'm telling the student, the Slack is the difference between when you start to press the trigger and where that trigger breaks, right? To be able to give the example of saying, you know how you drive somebody's car or you're used to driving your car? and their brakes are really loose mm -hmm. and it takes forever to seem like the car will actually stop that those brakes have more slack in them and little things like that, that a beginner goes, Oh, I feel what you're saying. Then right. you get back in your car and you know, or you can feel through reps. Like when you get in your car and you hear something that's just not right. You're like, nah, that sound wasn't there. You can feel it. Right. Like shooting being cerebral like that. You'll be able to feel when you got a good purchase. You'll feel when you got a great grip. You'll feel my support hand is right there. Being able to consistently have aha moments by making it simple and the students are open is something that I truly, truly, truly enjoy. So because of that, um, we generally focus on beginners. We go beginners to intermediate, but I, I, I haven't done enough um, high level training consistently to try to like Okay, I might know a few things on a on a higher level, but that's not where my wheelhouse is. Yeah, I can, I can appreciate that. And so our classes are usually ninety percent absolute beginners, and and maybe the other split between the ten percent is like five percent dudes that's like just came to like hang out and meet and help. And some people, the other five percent is like people intermediates that want to kind of step up, but it's it's beginners that are curious and just accept that. You know, I, my social media presence is exactly who I am. They they feel like this dude feels like me. This dude, you know, I might you, we might even disagree, but I want to have a drink with that dude after we disagree. I've said this on the show a million times, and that is good coaches know other good coaches. And, and and a person, when they get a great coach after they've maybe had some just mediocre coaches or really even like poor coaches, they recognize it right away. And it generally comes, it starts with, obviously the coach has to be knowledgeable and have a certain level of expertise. Uh, they have to have strong communication skills, but they need to be able to connect with their clients and talk to them and work with them in ways that make sense for them in that, in that given time. Um, and now more than ever, what I see are people that are obviously a bit more curious and a bit more aware of, uh, Maybe having a firearm in the home is a good idea. Maybe having a firearm on my person when I'm not in my home, you know, out with my family or, on, you know, on the road trip or whatever else is a good idea. Uh, and they're, they're a little nervous about even talking to people about it. And particularly here, it's like shared from the beginning, like, you know, being on the West Coast, man. I mean, I live in California. I have no idea what the laws and restrictions are in a place like Philadelphia or a state like Pennsylvania uh, and how I know how pe confused people here are. And 
it's no wonder they're confused. I mean, I see stuff coming out on the media from our politicians and people at the highest level of government saying things that don't make any sense that hold no truth whatsoever. They're confusing people anymore. Um, I'm, I'm wondering how the message is, re- is being received before they get to you, before these, before these, these new beginners or these people that are curious get to you. I wonder it's how, it, how it's being received by them and how they're bringing it to you. And like, what are the most common questions that you're getting or being asked right now? Like, I mean, and I mean like this week, particularly with all the shit that's going on, man, cause it's crazy out there. Um, two things. If they're, if they've already came to one of our classes right now, the question is, yo, this HR 1808 thing that I'm, I'm hearing about, what is that? And not, not, from a, not from a place of like, I want to do something negative. Usually the question that I get is, when is it okay for me to shoot somebody? I don't want to run afoul of the law. I know that I want to defend myself, but what's the protocol for that? You know, um, and obviously we tell them, okay, you need to have a sharp definition through training of what imminent danger means. You know, right now, imminent threat right now. If it's not, dude had a gun, then he left and he came back. So I shot him. You should have got out of there when he left. Right. The best fight is the fight you never get in. Right. And so those are the two, the two most common questions that I'm getting right now. And again, I love that a beginner that came to two free classes is asking me about HR 1808. They don't even think about gun legislation before a gun class. And to speed them to that point, I don't, I don't even have to convince them of anything those light bulbs start to go off. If I say, well, there's a bunch of people that believe that this firearm is semi-automatic pistol, because that's what they're going for from for to um, or rifle is something that they feel like through through slick wording, they're going to try to make you a felon for having that, you know, if you don't comply. That person is more empowered to then say, hell no, I'm not voting right. for that dude. Right. You, especially if I just scrounged up the last seven hundred dollars to get this gun. If I had to save and and buy a firearm, then buy the ammo, and I'm taking all as many free classes as I can with Maj, and I'll go to the range with Maj. Who shouts to uh, shoot indoors in King of Pressure? You know, I'll, I'll shoot with Maj over there, and we get them in there for the low, and they can go hang with me. And they're budgeting, and and they understand their personal equity, which is what you're helping them build on top of all that. Right. And now here you come telling them they got to just know. turn that in or, or, or we're doing a gun buyback. You didn't buy it. You didn't buy it in the first place. How can you buy it back? And so those are the light bulbs. That, those light bulbs are the things that instructors live for. Mm-hmm. It's not a ton un, until you start getting to a different level of coaching. Right. And my classes are free. So financially, I could probably charge a thousand dollars per session, probably like personal sessions. I don't. I do a lot of free classes, my access, my information base and my the people that I could call for information and then go immediately implement it. I could probably get a thousand dollars a session that does not help spread the movement. It limits you even more. It, it would limit you. It would make it would make that circle so small that you really wouldn't be making an impact on any of it. It wouldn't expand the movement. And so. A, an instructor that finds joy in those aha moments, those light bulbs with their students, Mm -hmm. that's payment. When you, when someone goes, when I say you got to turn your support hand in a bit. And when it starts clicking at them, when their thumb is there and they're not trying to use their thumb, they're actually turning that wrist up and they're maintaining. And they're like, Oh, the gun is pretty much floating and I'm just pulling the trigger. So the slide is just going back and forth. Them aha moments that, Nothing can. Yeah, there's no paycheck that can overdo that. It's like somebody walking in to the gym or to any situation for that matter where you've been in somewhat in charge of their care or helping them with their care and whatever it might be, financial, health, medical, whatever. And they go, I couldn't have done this without you. You know, you saved my life. It, there's no fucking paycheck that can that can outdo that type of a thing, which that just drives drives the great coaches to do more of the work. So, and I could see where people, and cause I've been there too, like people from the outside going, look, is this dude for real? Like what's really going on in the back end? And then the unfortunate part is, is like we saw particularly over the last two years, particularly with a lot of these nonprofits, the money grab they were trying to have and the things that they did. So going back to, you know, now that you're, you're kind of bringing these people in and you're, you're supporting them and 
at some level, there has to be funding, right, to make all of this go. It, it, it has to go. And, and people are always going to be like, yeah, this guy's just in it for the, the dough or he wouldn't be doing it. Unfortunately, that's just a fucking reality. You know, the merch and other things that I got floating around, passive income issues and stuff like that, right? I, I make a good way for myself, right? Um, the interesting thing, though, is I would probably I would have ten million dollars in cash by now if I wasn't doing this. And I know that world. And I have people that's like, what's up? Like that own farms in Washington. My point is, like, I, I would absolutely have ten million dollars in cash at this point if I wasn't doing this work. It's just not as fulfilling to me. It's just not as fulfilling. Now, don't get me wrong. Oh, we're going to get that ten million. We're going to get, the, you know, the, the, the gear and the merch and all that other stuff. This this next level of merchandising will be great. Huge shouts to, uh, you know, the folks that I'm working with to make, you know, a more custom line of solutionary and Black Guns Matter apparel. Um, that's coming, you know, pretty soon here. But my point is, you can get the money and still serve the community. Everyone knows that, like, on the internet, it's a running joke that um, I, my favorite car is a Bentley Continental GT. Like, okay. I just love that car, right? And the running joke when uh, years ago, uh, my guy Oski, uh, he's over there in Cali. He's in the Bay. He'll say, uh, I, we would joke about this. And it was like, yo, if they come buy me off, how you'll know is if I'll have two Bentley Continental GTs, one black and one white. You're bought and paid for. Yeah. <laughs> but when these guys say this, it's like, oh, it's only in it for the money. It's like, bro, if, you know, I'm a, I'm a pretty frugal dude, right? But if there was money hand over fist at this point in this work, I absolutely would have one black Bentley Continental GT. They only a quarter of a million dollars. And if I buy one used, I absolutely know I could get one cheaper than that. And they only change their body models like every five or six years. So I might could only go back to 2019, 2018 and get a good deal on one. But my point in that is those things will come. I have the intellectual capacity and the financial prowess to make that happen. But I wouldn't all the way feel that way if, uh, good about it until, you know, if I don't have the farm that I want for my family, literally a farm. Um, there's, if, I, if I don't feel like I've done enough, you know, for my community, like buying this building outright so people can come learn for free. Because I'm fine. I'm absolutely not struggling. There's no like I don't my daughter. My daughter has no idea what like public transportation is or like. And it's funny because we've raised these children and some of the things that make us strong, we kind of protect them from it a little bit. But like my daughter's homeschooled. My daughter's like, what is McDonald's? Like, you know what I'm saying? Right. Like, oh, I know. Yeah. My daughter, my daughter at like eight years old, we, we walked her past the Taco Bell and she was like, is that a Taco Bell? She'd never been to Taco Bell before. And yeah, I was like, it's just. It's not weird. It's just is what it is. That's how we raise them. And, and it's like these guys, and I, and I get it. I understand why, because usually for someone to be semi-successful, my definition of success is the work that we, you know, some of the goals that we set out to accomplish and we have. Our, yeah. our goal was to make, you know, the black community be the largest gun buying demographic in America. We accomplished that three years mm -hmm. ago. In under three years with under $300,000, just doing mm -hmm. the work. Mm -hmm. And so, and those numbers have increased annually, like damn near every year that record is, 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 you know, advancing. Not again, not to disparage the white community, the Spanish, anything like that, but we had to fix where the problem was first. And we also highlighted, we knew, you know, as soon as we started doing this, watch them start trying to attack firearms again. People said that what Joy Behar said on The View was insensitive, and it was um, in regards to as soon as black people start buying guns, then you'll see the laws change. But historically, that was accurate. Anytime black people have started buying guns, Democrats are like, hey, let's let's push more gun control legislation. Right. So right. being able to be in a space to serve the people and get your goals accomplished with, in essence, peanuts, because some bigger organizations, three hundred thousand dollars is dropping like, the bucket, man. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, that is success. So being successful in that regard, you understand why some people can't. You know, some of us can't see greatness in ourselves. So we it's impossible to fathom that I'm just not out here. We're not just doing it's this work the, the on our own. imposter syndrome, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So I get it. I, now I just laugh at it a little bit because 
I, I, I know that thought process well. Um, I just I just don't suffer from it. Um, but I understand that it could be tricky because it's like when people are like Jay-Z and Beyonce are in the Illuminati and it's like, well, maybe they are or or maybe they've both been doing something for about 30 years and busting their tails. Right. Working hard. Maybe they maintained relationships. Maybe they made sound financial decisions. Maybe Beyonce is the greatest entertainer alive and the closest thing to Michael Jackson that we have. Maybe. Maybe that has something to do with it. Maybe they got a good management team. Maybe they had made, you know, or they could just be the Illuminati. But I understand, like, I understand this um, almost disbelief that someone could just, we just go outside and just do whatever we want. I'm actually a free man. I'm actually, I literally say, hey, I don't carry licenses to carry. I carry everywhere. I carry in New York. I carry in California. Last time I was in California, I flew to LAX with a firearm. No, it was not California compliant. People think that it's got to be some Illuminati statement because I'm saying it so no, open. I, I, I know firsthand exactly what you're talking about because I've done it myself. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, bro, just, just go there. Just do it. Concealed is concealed. When I'm in New York and I'm doing such and such a show, yeah, I got a gun in the studio. Yes. Yes. Because, you know, as Elijah Dickens shown us, it could go down anyway. Yeah, you better be ready. Uh, yeah. It's being ready for anything might let or life might throw at you no matter where you are. And specifically now it seems we're in just crazy. I don't know if it's crazy world or we're just more, more aware of how crazy it is right now. I wonder if it's crazy for you having to deal with or how and dealing with like you have your community and the strong community that you built, but what about those that are involved in government at the community level and even law enforcement at the community level, city council, those kind of things, what kind of interactions or friction or support, or I guess what kind of a, a I mean, you're talking about the solutionary center. What types of solutions do you have to come up with on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis to keep this thing going and not have people run interference and whatnot? Um, so I have good relationships with the guys that I know in law enforcement across the country. They understand that when I'm very critical of bad law enforcement, mm -hmm. they know that I'm not talking. I'm not talking about them. Them, yeah. If if you're a guy that puts on that uniform or woman. And your thing is, I want to chase actual crime today, right? Crime has to have a victim. It's not a, it's just a statute if it's, and that's just revenue generation for the state if there's no crime. So for example, if I do something that impacts someone's body or their property, that's usually in alignment with actual crime, right? Um, rape, robbery, homicide. There are there are officers that ignore the brass. That. Really want to serve and protect, even though they have no legal obligation to serve and protect, like that's a Supreme Court ruling and has been upheld several times. I have respect for like homicide detectives. That are like somebody killed somebody unjustifiably. This case is 10 years old, but I'm going to work through old cold cases right. to bring to justice and get some justice for the family members and loved ones of this person. Right. That dude I'm respecting all day. No doubt about it. The guy that is putting on a uniform because he wants to look cool. He wants to be badass. He wants to cherry pick his calls. I don't give a fuck about him. I do not care. I hope I hope something happens to you because you're making it harder for my friends and family members that are law enforcement, because not only are they really trying to do the right thing there, they're also fighting against extreme leftists that have painted every single officer a certain way. Mm -hmm. The problem is usually when I'm critical of those officers, you have other guys that will say like. Somehow that's me being anti-cop. I'm anti you not doing the job of serving and protecting and upholding the Constitution. 
And when I and it don't even got to be as extreme as you were like beating up dudes, you know, killing Tony Temper. I'm not even talking about that. It, the reality is, if you take a firearm off of a guy that has not shot somebody with that firearm or in a commission of a crime or something like that, you're upholding an unconstitutional statute. That's not an argument. That's me telling you what it actually is. It's the law, right? It's the don't, law. Don't get mad at me that you've capitulated to not the Constitution. You've capitulated to, well, my boss is telling me to do that. That's not what the, that's not the honorable portion of the job for me. Again, the, the, the men and women that I will honor, those folks that are like, fuck yeah, we're going to catch bad guys today. When, when, again, and some of that's not sexy work, not chasing them down, those homicide detectives that have to sift through evidence from 10, 20 years old, those dudes that have to like find DNA because this guy's repeatedly raping folks, those, 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 those type of detectives, you know, I'm here for those guys because I understand what that job is. You take that stuff home with you. You know, my, I was talking to Dr. Boyce Watkins. We had a, a lunch a, a week or so ago in Philly. And his wife is a social worker. And she has to, he was telling me how she has to somewhat, and he said this publicly because I, you know, I, I don't want anybody to think I'm betraying his trust. As a social worker, you have to somewhat detach because you'll see some of the worst stuff. He gave me an example of like a nine month old pregnant woman stabbed in the stomach. Right. A social worker and a police officer have to see that. I've heard of these stories on this show before and too. It's, yeah. You see what I'm saying? And so it's like, you, it's, it's hard to unpack that or just like, I'm just going to put it away and leave it at work. That's not a basketball game. No. Those men and women, I have the utmost respect for. But when you're just like, respect the badge and, and you're controlling and patrolling a community and you're treating all of the citizens like enemy combatants, you know, and I, and, and I love the book um, on killing by, uh, I always forget his name, Grossman, Dave Grossman. But it's like some of those classes are like, damn, are we teaching the, are we teaching the um, everyday officer to look at people in the communities as if they're not Americans? Wow. You know what I'm saying? And that's the part where I'm, I, I give pushback. But generally, law enforcement wise, um, we have a good rapport. Um, all of my law enforcement friends know I'm not going to follow any unconstitutional statutes. They know that everywhere that I go, everybody knows I got a gun on me. Everybody mm -hmm. knows that there's no there's it's no high, like even me concealing isn't concealing anymore. Like it's my right. face. Yeah, right, right. You're out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Being that person that is able to articulate the concerns of the American people, especially urban America. Yo, you might be handling certain demographics with a heavy hand. The, the police officers in New York are trash. Generally, they are trash at dealing with citizens. Not every single. I don't know every single, but the vast majority of interactions that I've heard of, seen and been a part of. It's like, bro, you're you're talking to people like they're not of also grown men. That that and that to be perfectly honest, a lot of you, if you didn't have that shield and that outfit, you would be quiet as fucking church mice. And so that's the part where the balance and the nuance, not only do I get a little bit of pushback from some guys, because this is their fraternity. This is their fraternity, as well as I get that pushback from some so-called conservatives because they, again, overcorrection. The leftists go extreme. All of the police are bad. You go extreme. Everything that the police do is perfect. As soon as you start going with the absolutes, I start running the other way. There's nuance in everything. I, as soon as you start going with the absolutes, I'm going the other way. And so to come out and continually and boldly say that when the, 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 what we see happening pretty regularly all over, to do that is ignorant. It's ignorant. And it, it, it just puts you in the same light as maybe somebody on the other side who is saying things that couldn't be any closer to the truth. Or, or further from the truth. I do think there's serious systemic problems with policing in America, especially in urban America. Not not maybe not in like when I'm in like those small towns where the sheriffs is around, they know the community. They like, yeah, that's Steve. Steve's weird, but Steve's not a threat. Like, come on, bro. You know what I'm saying? So it may be different there because, again, I want to paint with that broad brush. But like if, if you're 
Like, bro, you can't just say to guys that, you know, bro, okay, you don't want to say it about black dudes. Okay, Tony Temper is a textbook case of like, no, no, this is wrong. This is wrong. Yeah, you're right. And it's like, it's like uh, we get that pushback in the conservative spaces because listen, bro, I'm going I'm to be with you, but my highest alignment is to the truth. And if that truth is, and, and I'm going I'm to express that truth in a very empathetic way. Nah, I've seen good cops. I've seen horrible cops. I've seen people in my community that are horrible people and people that are great people. So the nuance is always there. But if you're always just going back to blue, no matter what, as a as a reactionary push to extreme leftists, that just makes you equally extreme. Conservatism is about limited government, not giving, you know, government in the form of foot soldiers for the state a blank check. This has been lost, man. It was just gotten wildly out of control. You're right on with that. Like it, it's 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 not about how much power can you have? It's how little power do you need in order to keep things uh, in the best interest of the people that put you in the positions that you're in. But it's, 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 wildly it's weird perverted. because me being yeah. a black dude, right? If I say it that way, and if I challenge a famous conservative or famous libertarian or whoever, each group has a different name to call me because I'm nuanced. I have not seen a solid president that I could be like, God damn, that guy was amazing. My favorite president is John F. Kennedy. And it's like, dude was a Democrat. And dude, that, that, def, that, give me those Democrats. I don't, I don't think a lot of people, a lot of people that are probably arguing with you probably can't remember who that even is. And if they, if you ask them any history about that, that guy and what the Democratic Party and U.S. government and foreign policy and all those things were at that time, they couldn't tell you. They don't, they don't have anything to base that on all the, the very short term memory and very short term memory loss. And so all they're remembering is what happened to them yesterday that pissed them off um, and all the bad things that were associated with that. And and that is the basis for every conversation now. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but that's that's I think where you're going with this is is everybody's labeling you. And the label should be, if any, the label should be object not even just free thinker, but objective thinker. When when you carry a firearm, you have to assess levels of potential threat or actual threat consistently. You have to be very vigilant. So it, it's, a, it's a conditioning technique, which makes me go, yeah, we absolutely got to shoot this dude. Or, no, we don't got to shoot that dude. Or, we may have to shoot this dude, so let's get out of here. So we don't have to shoot this dude. It's constant. It's like, it's like firearm. It's like muzzle awareness. It's, well, pointing the gun down is great if you're on the first floor or in the basement. But what about if you're in a second or third floor apartment? I just want to challenge people to think with more nuance, bro. No team. I'm a libertarian that says I'm a libertarian because I understand the ideology and I think it could actually save our republic. I also understand that conservative values have a place. I don't think that the free for all, I am free to walk around naked. I don't think that's socially responsible. So I'm more conservative. I like being in the sun. But yeah, my, maybe, maybe my six year old daughter doesn't need to see her dad walking in the backyard naked. So I need to be a little bit more conservative. There is a balance. The best type of markets with free enterprise have a mixture, a, a mixed economy, right? We give, are running almost a social program. People are giving us money and we're allocating it to where it needs to go to benefit the individuals and the collective. That's a mixed bag. I don't want a team. I want to be team freedom and objectivity to find out what's the best thing moment to moment for the American people collectively and, and you know, individually, collectively and humanity at, at, at large. That's the root. That's the roots of the Constitution of the United States. What you just explained right there. It becomes a constant. I get support and love from all of these different groups when I'm giving free classes to those communities that may not even know what my political affiliation is, that I get love. When I challenge them, like, yo, bro, everything, just because he's wearing a Trump hat, that don't make him racist, then I'm going to get attacked, right? <laughs> and vice versa, when I go, yo, I'm at CPAC, but then I say, hey, guys, 
You are not highlighting Frederick Douglass, who is the best conservative of all time. And you're leaving yourself open for lefties to paint you as racist because you're doing a trash job at messaging. Then I get attacked. Oh, you're a leftist. Then I get attacked that way. When I'm telling guys in the Libertarian Party for the last four years, like, yo, I'm a Libertarian, but I'm not being directly trying to get people in the community to go into the Libertarian Party because Nick Sarwark is, is an absolute horrible leader for the Libertarian Party. Mm. I, I told it to him to his face. I told like, mm. there's no, you know what I'm saying? Then the, those Libertarians go, oh, you must still be a statist. No, dude smells like the police to me. He's, he's, he's not sitting, sitting there to actually do a job. So then the Mises Caucus takes over the Libertarian Party and I'm all in getting the hood on board. My point here is, if I, I am familiar that if I picked one and just was quiet about that team's inconsistencies, my fame would skyrocket. I'm aware of that. That is not what the American people need as leadership, as, as a representative of a well-balanced dude. George Washington didn't even want party systems. Like on, on his deathbed was damn near like, dudes, don't do the party thing. It's going to like mess the whole thing up. Dude did not want to be the president. They had to like convince Washington. He was like, all right, I did the war thing. We good. I'm, I'm chilling. I'm on the farm. And they're like, bro, you really should like, come on. The, there's a saying that the people that should run for office don't because they're not really power hungry. The people that do run for office are power hungry, so they kind of shouldn't run. They shouldn't be in the seat. And it's a weird dichotomy. And as I look at across the, 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 the plane, I see men and women running for office that out of like damn near like, all right, I got to do it. Talking about guys like Ian Smith over in Jersey, good friend of mine. Mm -hmm. Talk, mm -hmm. Talking about when I ran for city council in mm -hmm. Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Talking about Tony Cowden down in, uh, in North Carolina. Dudes that are like, all right, fuck it, bro. Like, I, I got to do something. But these are also men that understand and women that understand, like, I'm doing this to kind of actually represent for the people. Right now, everybody's usurping. Nancy Pelosi is about to go to Taiwan and it's going to cost the American people ninety million dollars. Yeah. yeah, I call that one pigeon management where they where they fly in, they shit all over everything and then they fly out and everybody else has to clean up all the mess. Uh, and they have zero skin in the game, by the way, there's zero accountability to any of this and, and nothing will get accomplished by this that will be positive. Not one single thing. And yet we're just shelling out $1 after another. And somehow they don't have to ask permission for this. They just do it. And we're supposed to be okay with it. Huge uh, shouts to Thomas Massey, who's been like super on it and defending from the great state of Kentucky, been fighting against all of this silliness since like the, the COVID first, like we're going to do a secret vote thing, you know, and I just I just saying all of this to say these are the pushbacks that we get. Because it's situational America, if we say we're free thinkers, if we really say that, right, we got to like really like push back in, in multiple areas and it, and there has to be some, you know, when, when the constitution and stuff was written in Philadelphia, where I live or signed at least, these dudes were like brawling, drinking pints, arguing over how we can make this joint the littest with their contradictions. Cause Thomas Jefferson wrote the declaration of independence while he owned humans. Right. I love America. I love where we live. I love the American people. I hate the American government. It is not trustworthy. We have to be able to say these things. You know, I got into it with Matt Walsh a few days ago, little Twitter spat. And it's like, bro, you bringing up slavery in other countries. And it almost kind of looks like you're diminishing when black people are saying slavery in America. But there was a hundred years of negative stuff that happened to black people after. So don't go like doing the what about isms that makes it more difficult for black to move people things to forward. Yeah. And to move forward. Yes. And, and I'm also going to tell my community, like, listen, bro, we do understand that there are some systemic things like it, it exists. Redlining, segregation, school choice. Absolutely. Those gun control. Absolutely racist, bro. They can't stop you with that now, though. It's there. But once you highlight it and go, that's that's some bullshit and we're going to move forward. 
<clears throat> you can't do that. And then stay mad. Yeah. Right. And, or, 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 or like, you know that the system is the game is rigged. If you're not like really rich in America, and if you're not or really smart, fully on board with that, just ask anybody what it, what uh, just ask anybody about the current political system and and how it works. Like, what is this HR 1808? What is what is this thing? Like, I, what is it? Like, they have no idea. It's got a funny. It's got a funny name. Makes no sense at all. Like, they don't know. And they might reword it like something that sounds nice, and you'd be like, oh. The Help America Act. Okay, mm. we'll get behind that because you didn't mm. read the that bill. That sounds good. No, nor did you read all the other stuff that got snuck in the back end of that thing. If you're not politically intelligent and educated or rich or just got a good understanding of how this system goes, right, it's rigged against you. You can't tell me that, which I agree with, and then make bad financial choices by throwing mm. some of my friends mm. throw thousands upon thousands of dollars every week at the strip club. Don't tell me about the system if you don't make conservative fiscal choices. This place is based on money and violence. So you can violently protect your money and stuff with violence. You can violently gobble up property and because this place is about property rights with the right money. So don't talk to me about the system doing you wrong if you... Spent ten thousand dollars last month at the strip club. That's you, bro. Because this place, you could turn that ten grand into a hundred, and you could make some real progress with a hundred thousand dollars down. You could damn near get in certain parts of the country on a million dollars. You can get damn near fifty football fields. So there's a balanced and a nuanced approach to this thing that I strive to represent every day, and that's what America needs. <laughs> We need more people in the middle calling both sides out, supporting both sides at the same time, respecting the simple fact that we are all Americans and we are all humans and we all have differences. It's again, it's tomatoes, it's, it's croutons, <laughs> it's all of this different stuff in the, in the salad that is America. And the quicker we do that and people like me that are willing to get, you know, I got ratioed like hell on Twitter for critiquing some, you know, some of the more conservative dudes. But it got to be some of those people like myself that are willing to go over the hill first and say, like, yeah, I'm going into all of the urban areas and I'm teaching black people about firearms ownership. That's racist. Gun control is actually racist, not like he's wearing a red hat racist. No, like actually, we don't want the blacks to have guns. That's a legit thing. So that's what I'm going to go do that. And then people will, will trailblaze and then people will follow and we'll you know, we plant in the seeds and everybody going to eat the apples and the fruits and vegetables. After we grow it, you know, or after it grows in due time over the seasons, you know, and so we just need more people to step up in that lane or whatever their lane is to to be that um, to that voice. And, and I'm again, I, you know, I said a lot, but I'm really honored um, to serve in that capacity, man, because if you say you a leader. You're doing a lot of work if you actually. Elite. Yeah, I agree with you there. And so I think that's probably the million dollar question that probably a lot of people are thinking is, is like, can you do that work from political office? Is that something that you're considering? You mentioned city council there. Is there a place for you in that arena? If not now, at some point, is that something you're even interested in doing? Yeah, um, there's been rumors of me running for like a seat in a libertarian situation. I've been thinking more about running for mayor of Philadelphia. Even if you get beat up, you expose a lot of people to new I love thought. it. I love that. Yep. And you know, it's a fight. You expect contact. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a fight. You're gonna get you're gonna get punched in the mouth, but it's not something that hasn't happened to you before, right? So I know that I'm very impactful outside of the system. I used to always say that I respected and still respect uh, former President Barack Obama because when he ran, I don't believe in a lot of the things that he did. Um, legislation wise. Right. Um, and I want to be clear that Obama under his presidency bombed more black and brown nations than any president in world Facts. history. And you know what I'm saying? So I want to be clear on that. But what I did love about President Obama, symbolically, he had a beautiful family. And I hate when guys talk about like people's wives and children. I just don't do that. But he had a beautiful family. He handled the racist shit that was said about him during the campaign trail with such an amazing. There was grace there for sure, man. Yeah. 
He could have he could have gone a way different direction on it. Because some of the stuff that was said, if I was like, damn, if somebody said that shit to me, like <laughs> So symbolically, young black kids felt like there's a whole generation of young people that don't have the, the ceiling of you got to be the white dude to be a president. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And mm-hmm. symbolically, our nation needed that. Black Guns Matter has sponsors now. Huge shouts to Brownells. Huge shouts to um, Phoenix Ammo. Right. Our two sponsors that, that, that super support us. Everybody should go to Brownells and buy some stuff. Everybody should go to Phoenix Ammo and buy some ammo. They jive with me because they let me have room, but some companies will back off of me because of my political. A lot of risk, a lot of risk for them there. It could work out great because it could be the controversy. You know, we had controversy around the panel that we did in CPAC. And when they ran the numbers, the controversy before and after it, they would have had to spend $4 million in advertising to get what we got them at CPAC. Is that right? Yeah. Wow. Then Matt wow. Slap didn't invite me yeah. back anymore. <laughs> I saw some of that. It was very entertaining. The reality is I understand that if I took on more of a political role, the responsible thing to do would for, for me would be for me to censor mm-hmm. myself more. Yeah, yeah, you have to be very careful in the messaging these days, man, because of what you just said. And people want to be on board with you, but there's other people, board of directors. Am I am I more useful on that so-called outside influencing things? Or would I be more useful in that spot? But I'm kind of being a coward to not develop that skill set. Oh, that's Oh, that's interesting. That is interesting. Not being a coward, like kind of just copping out and going, you know what? I just, nah, I can't deal. I don't want to deal with that versus putting in work to go, how can I deal with this better, more effectively, more efficiently? I don't know, man. What answer did you come up with? I, I still don't know because. It's a, it, the playing, the playing field is, is fucked up, man. So it's like, it changes every day. So you never know. There will be so more. It's like when Tiger Woods started getting notoriety for playing golf. There was dudes from the hood going to play right. golf. Yeah, yeah, it's true. And it opened up a door. And I'm not, again, I'm not saying this to disparage any other group. I'm just saying like, uh, forget my race, right? A person that thinks like me, that's from the area that I'm from, that so many people would feel inspired by, man, that would be a big deal. That would be a big deal. And, and, and I could maintain the core values of who I am. That would be a big deal. So sometimes I question myself like, yo, is you copping out a bit? There's a story. I don't know if um, people have ever um, heard of this called the Bhagavad Gita, which is like an Indian um, section of the Mahabharat, which is like the Hindu book. Right. There's the story of Arjuna, um, who was an archer. Right. Who, you know, a bow and arrow. And he lost his swing. He lost his focus. And Krishna, who's like Christ, for lack of a better term, manifests and tells him, like, you got to be on get back on point because you're going to fight in this big religious war. And the enemies of righteousness, some of them were like his family okay. members. And up until that point, Arjuna had been taught empathy and don't harm things and don't go to war. and He utilized that when he was talking to Krishna about like, yo, my whole teaching has been passive and respecting and not attacking things. And Krishna kind of told him like, well, yeah, that was your teaching up until this point. Now it's time to fucking go to war. It's a chapter, man. Yeah. Put the, where the rubber meets the road. Yeah. And he's saying, well, my uncles, they don't, they don't know. They, you know, we've been taught to. And Krishna showed him a vision of the battlefield and okay. the enemies of okay. righteousness were already dead. And he showed him this and he said, listen, this is already pretty much done. You can either pick up your mantle and do it because right now you bitching, bro. Like you're trying to use your teaching to block from your to hide behind the reality of you're, you're actually afraid. So you can pick up your mantle and actually get busy. Or the very nature of who you are will force you to, and you'll just suffer the entire way. And I think about that story when I'm like, nah, bro, the the system isn't ready for somebody like me. Okay, well, polish up a little bit. You still get to be you. Maybe you need to polish up a bit. And I'm struggling with that. 
am I co- like kind of like, ah, oh, you know, I don't like them Hollywood people. Yeah. How, how, OK. When you're doing a 72 hour survival course, do you like it? No, you don't. When you're in the gym and you're doing five sets of 20 under the squat rack. Oh, this feels great. It's a walk in the park. No. And so these are the questions. They actually made a movie about that um, and they never promote it. The entire story is an offshoot of that story of Arjuna and Krishna. It's called The Legend of Bagger Vance. Oh, I've seen that. Will Smith is Will Smith is Krishna. Okay, okay, yeah. All right. Matt Damon's character, what was his name? Juna. That's right. And he's Arjuna. Gotcha. He's playing golf. And that's why Krishna or God played by Will Smith appears to show him how to get his stroke back. I'm going back to watch that movie now, man. I never put that. Never heard that story before. I never put it together. Great movie. If you notice in the movie, even at the end where Matt Damon's character, because it ties in the beginning to the end where Matt Damon's character is playing golf as he's telling the story. And then he passes out on Mm -hmm. the golf course. The Mm -hmm. golf course is a representation of Earth. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. The green, right? Just like in a game of pool, the green represents the earth. Um, and then he stands up, and Will Smith's character is calling towards him like this. He's passed and transitioned into the next realm, and he's going to meet with God, meet his friend. You just connected a lot of dots for me, man. And I, that, that actually just brings it back. So I think I hear where you're coming from. And I heard what you said there about, like, you know, I don't get on with these Hollywood types, and it's just not my. I think that is the problem. Like, I think that is, I mean, and you mentioned the challenges that people are going to face if you are not rich, right? And you are not, you don't, you haven't been exposed to a certain education, whether that's self-learned and knowing how to do that and get that information and be able to have good conversations with people that are knowledgeable and share their experiences and wisdom or going to university or a place where they may be able to give you more of this information and provide pathways for you in order for you to get it. Uh, albeit uh, it could be a little bit slighted one direction versus another in terms of information you're getting. But man, I think that's what, I really think that's what a lot of people, and I, I, I don't know, but I, I can't say like the majority of America, I don't know the majority of my friends, right. And the people that I know in my family are ready for something different. They're ready for somebody to just come in and, blow the thing up, so to speak. I mean, we heard the term like drain the swamp or whatever, kind of in that, in that, in that similar, I guess, tone would be need somebody to come in and drop a grenade in the middle of this thing. And just, there's a shock and awe value that comes with that. Right. And then there's a little bit of, there's some casualties that come along with that. And then out of that also comes like, well, I don't want to see this again. So maybe I should, and I'm, I'm awake now to listen to this. I should listen to this. Now I should keep my head on so because man, maybe there's other people out here that can provide this same kind of perspective. So I struggle with that as a guy sitting on the other side going, you know, I know political office is in the right place for me. It's not something I have any desire to do, but I'm, I'm with you in terms of spreading the message and helping people become empowered and enabled to have different types of conversations and think differently, which is the biggest part. And if they see people like you and they're inspired to do that um, it, with the messaging that you have, and they see you moving through the pathways, which they found to be so restrictive or just there be such a barrier. I think it opens up the, the, the pathway for other people, man. It's the symbolism. And with hopefully, you know, you know, I, I'm adding value and substance. But it's the symbolism that makes a person go like, hmm, that's why I always got behind these guys. A lot of them I never met physically. That symbolism is very important because it opens a wider door. Symbol, I think that's, that, that's kind of like the Trump effect, too. Again, I, I'm, I'm super critical of Trump on the Second Amendment thing, the, the Fourth Amendment mm. thing, you know, like take the guns, get, get the person later. Silly statement. Disagree with it where I'm 100% on board with Trump was, you know, like the business of America. Nobody ran it like a business. No, no, no one's saying like, yeah, I was getting way more money under Biden than I was under Uh, Trump. Like, uh, like you're a liar. Like you're a liar. Unless you're a bank, unless you're a bank, you are. Yeah. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? And so, or, or like Ukraine. Don't even get me started. Don't even get me started. (laughs) That objective nature. And I think he, he was a, a, a grenade. I don't know what happened. I think he's so used to listening to having a solid team and the, the team genuinely is trying to do the best. I think he had some bad actors 
that he listened to. Um, but I was there at the White House when he was saying like, yo, black people built America. I, I was there. I was right in the front row. I seen it with my own eyes. He was like, we all built it. He was like, but, you know, African-Americans are just now starting to get the respect that they deserve for your elders had a strong hand in building this country. I was there at that White House for that, for that present. I was in the West Wing, literally, where they do the little breakdowns. Then I walked to my hotel and I had a drink and I watched CNN chop that whole speech up and never made mention of it. So he's created some very powerful enemies because he's been, you know, America first. And that stands in the way of the globalist, you know, the, the whole Alex Jones, the globalists, the globalists, you know. But I think to have a black dude and not just because of race strategically. Can you imagine if like there was a mixture between Obama and Trump? No, I can't. But I could if I sat here and thought about it long enough, I could tell you it'd be super powerful because of perspective. Right. Not not because of of political background, of financial background, of educational background, professional, whatever life perspective coming from both sides of the both of them had to go through different things. I think part of it is too. like I look at Trump and I go I looked at him and I went now here's a guy who's been humiliated many times in his life many, many times um, publicly for whatever the case is. And the guy just keeps on going, right? He keeps pushing through. He keeps pushing through. Now, I'm, I'm not saying I love the guy. I'm just saying this is what I know, right? This is what I've seen. And then I look at the current guy who, despite every, all of the things that we see that you cannot cover up, like he's never been publicly humiliated and will never be publicly humiliated by those that have the power to do it and kind of lead the charge. And I think that's where you're getting at or you're getting at before. Uh, but uh, going back, like uh, I think Obama had been through a bit of that himself. Right. And, and that's that combination together with perspective plus all the other stuff. Man, oh man. Yeah. Who knows? Who knows? To get perspective, to get historic business, um, like I've done dealings in China, I've done dealings in blah blah blah. That that helps with a little bit of geopolitical. Oh, you think? Especially today, especially right now, what's happening right now today? Right. Even 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 to be able to be, hey, I'm charismatic, but and the people love me, but don't get it twisted. We will right. fuck you up. Yeah. Like to have that balance. And again, not to not to compare myself to these guys in that sense, but it's like I strive for that. It's like communicate with the people, know that I'm here for the people. I'm in the community. If you try me, though, I'm absolutely going to fuck you up. There's no I, there's no question about that. Um, my friends are really, really good men and women. They will fuck you up for me. And there needs to be a certain level. And that when that person commands a leader that commands that type of symbolic respect and sub substantial respect. And that person is humble and empathetic and still from goes from empathy to the facts. Then we get a solution. That person, yo, man, or groups of people like that and the team behind guys like that, that know how to pick good team members that, you know, wise counsel. Right. That are trustworthy. That that type of guy gets a lot of stuff done. And I, I just I, I try to make sure that with the pennies that we get, you know, we, we are creating that type of atmosphere. That person is a force multiplier. Yeah, exactly. That person is concerned about creating more leaders. You know, and the people that are like, I don't want to be a leader. I want to. But I want to join this army. I want to I want to do my part in this fight for liberty. That type of guy or woman is somebody that we all should aspire to be. You know, I read, I read The Art of the Deal by Trump. Those are two of my favorite books, The Art of the Deal and um, The Audacity of Hope by Barack Obama for vastly different reasons. And again, we're not talking about the legislation. We're talking about PR because PR is, you know, public relations, but it's also like perception and reality, yep. right? And so like, those books and those experiences and those that that un, that unrelenting drive to, can, to to persist, like like think about this, dude. Like you're a junior senator from Chicago, like, oh, and you're just so you're just gonna just jump right to, of the United States of America. Hell no, dude. You're a community activist, bro. Pump your brakes and like stay in your lane. Stay in your lane. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Same thing with same thing with like 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 
Fucking Trump had to damn near run as a black dude. He had to finance it himself. No one believed in him. He had to, he already had a bunch of bad stories about him that were true or untrue. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's 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 like a it's like a they're similar in that trajectory of everything says no. Do it mm-hmm. anyway. You know, and these are the things everything right now, you know, is saying no to the people. No. You you can't save your republic. No, you can't inform your community and make your community safe. No, you can't be financially independent and free. No, you 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 can't check government. It's too late. And all of that shit is wrong. All of that shit, like we have an obligation. And it's like the founders to this place like wrote that down too. Like, yo, bro, paraphrasing. If this shit get goofy out here, you guys have the right to fucking remove mm-hmm. it. And I just want to put that into perspective on people. And that doesn't mean you got to be like going to go kill people. It could be like, we'll starve you out. We will boycott Walmart and make Walmart lean on the politicians. Don't don't discount like when people are like, oh, boy, boycotting is for leftist or riots is for leftists. No, the Boston Tea Party, that shit happened. Bacon's rebellion happened. Why right. you're doing it and the purpose for why you're doing it got to be something righteous. And I, and I just want people and we're, 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 we still have multiple arenas of doing that political organizing. Just just how many people have tried to say we are absolutely going to starve any company that presents anti-gun shit and we're going to make an example out of you. Right. Oh, they're doing it on the other from the other perspective. Like they're figured, they figured out how to do that. If you are anti-gun, like if you're, if you're pro-gun, like we haven't figured out a way to do that to the anti-gun people. Because we, we playing in this game of like. Dependency. Yeah. yeah, Dependency. We want other people to make those decisions for us, or uh, we've gotten too comfortable. uh, It's this, the, it's, we, we just play in the world of comfortable and we don't like to be uncomfortable. And the people that know this that gain notoriety by saying some like catchy things that we can get behind. I fear that they, their interest is not again to expand the movement. I fear that, you know, I have friends that are high ranking folks over at the NRA. So I'm saying this as a loving critique, right? The NRA has between four or 5 million members annually. Mm -hmm. There's a hundred million gun owners in America. You guys aren't trying to expand to get 90 more mil, you know, mem- I, f- I feel like they lost their way. If I'm being honest, man, I feel like they lost their way and the data is showing it. Like, is, I think that's where you're going with this. You're, you're interested in selling product to your four or 5 million members over and over and over again. If you take some time, retool a bit, course, correct. Not only can you, let's say you lose 1 million of those members because new people come on board and whatever. They don't like that you're, not FUDs anymore. And you're more like, no actual second amendment. Okay. Yeah. Great. Now you get an extra 3 million folks, but you lose 1 million. Now you're down to 3 million. I'd be one of those guys. <laughs> now you get, now you're up to six or 7 million. You can still sell product to that six or 7 million. You're going to have to tighten the belt a bit. When you lose that first million, you'll start to get that. And when people start in these bigger organizations and, and the thought process and some of those more popular guys, conservative and libertarian, whatever's when they understand that, then they'll start, we'll start to see head, headway. We can be Whole Foods. We can do our actual mission and we make, can still make a shit ton of money while maintaining our principles because we'll have a bigger pool of people to sell stuff to. If, if the reason why people proudly wear Black Guns Matter gear, whether it's to make the hood great again shirt, whether it's all gun control is racist, make racist afraid again, whatever, like white dudes wear make racist afraid again shirts, right? The reason why they're so, you know, proud to wear it and sometimes dudes will wash it 10, 20, 30, 50 times, buy two more. is because they know that the principle is solid. I'm never going to waver on them. We're not going to be like, well, maybe some red flag laws. No, fuck you. We're not. And if that means I'm not going to get the the sponsorship with insert whatever company that's going to do the backdoor deal. And so be it, bro. Like, listen, again, my daughter is not starving for anything. She has everything she wants. 
The greed factor is not the reason the turtle wins the fucking race in the store. Yeah, it's it is. It really has to be, and people have to stick to their no pun intended. Stick to their guns, and it, the answer literally has to be "fuck you, no." And then it's just like if uh, you went to go get your car keys from your old man or whoever and said, hey, can I borrow the car tonight? And he, you fucked up for three days ago. Says, no, you were not getting the car tonight because you fucked up three days ago. Fuck you. No, you can't have them. It's the same thing. No, it's just like, that's the answer. There's a you must. There is you. You No, you can't have this. I'm not going to do it. And then you have the, have the intestinal fortitude and obviously the intellect to potentially have a conversation. But again, that intestinal fortitude to say, no, I'm going to stick to this. And it's just it. And it might be hard at first and a little uncomfortable. But I hear what you're saying is, is like we need to we need to rally these smaller groups together. I think it's happening, man. I really start. I'm starting to. To really feel it two years ago, I was really disenfranchised with the whole thing. But in this last year, particularly, I'm starting to see the tide turn a little bit. And I'm let's just say like intrinsically, I'm feeling better about it. And part of it is, is because I I'm using like this platform to go out and talk to people, to get educated, to gain perspective. I mean, the things that we've talked about today and what you provided for me has been hugely enlightening just kind of about, you know, who you're working with and how you're doing it and, and, and the thought process behind it and the challenges you've run into and also the successes you've had and not being afraid, but also being a little vulnerable and going, I don't know, maybe I'm a little afraid and maybe I, I don't know. I'm still working this out. More of these kinds of conversations need to happen. And I'm feeling like that groundswell is starting to get there. Yeah. And people are kind of running out of energy to be completely angry all the time. Where two years ago, it, everybody's just pissed off all the time. And so the bandwidth to be able to have this kind of conversations at any kind of a productive level was really diminished. It was very or very, very limited. And now we're getting to this next stage. I don't know. What do you say about that? Like in terms of your conversations? I say that in the beginning, say that over the last two years, right? COVID. That shit sounded scary. And then, you know, a year prior, they was doing stuff on the internet where like people in China was just like passing out. And then we were like, oh shit, that, that must be it. Now me, we got gas masks, a bunch of ammo. We already know what buildings we take in. I already know my next team. I, like it was just like, well, if this is the zombie apocalypse, this is what we train for. Right, like, right, this right. is where we at. But I understood the fear. Now, and watching it, because at first I'm like, I understand the fear, but I'm not going to capitulate to it. I understood why other people did, though. You know, they don't have 20,000 rounds of 223 in that right. next room. Right. They don't. Um, but then, over time... When people started saying, yo, man, this is kind of bullshit. They're lying. When Worldometers not only just tracked how many people had it and how many people survived or recovered, right. and people were like, wait, why isn't the news telling us this part? Yeah, there were guys like uh, Dr. Peter McCullough, um, guys like, uh, 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 you know, Robert Malone, I mean, from a doctor's They were literally trying to put these guys in, in the grave. They were literally trying to bury them. And everybody was like, why y'all going so hard? Instagram took two of my pages because I was like, hell no, selling fuck that vaccine shirts. The, the people started going, not only were they tired of being told what to do, like you said, the fear wore off and the fact that the matter started to show up to the point where now Fauci's like saying shit like, well, we never advocated for anybody to lock anything down. Stop it. Stop it. It's, that's so insulting. Like, you know what I mean? Like, Really? Because all the video says you doing it. This is you, yeah. bro. This is you saying exactly that. Like I've forgotten again, going back to the short term memory problem and the and the and the short and the quick memory loss. Like, are you fucking serious? Like, stop it. So, like, the anger is almost coming back in, but it's comical now. It's it comical. was so much trauma that people actually remember, and they're like, and people like me. I deliberately, we bought an RV over this time period. We were like, cool, we're going to keep getting kicked off planes. We're going to get an RV. Everyone, because I don't want to sound like fucking Biden, just go buy an electric car. Like, because everybody can't just go buy a $100,000 RV. But my point in saying this is, we, the people got tired. The people were like, bro, it's not matching up. It's been a year for, of two weeks to slow the spread. It's been two years. Stop it. 
And those voices just continue like, again, why I'm I'm, I'm a fan of the symbolism of Trump and the symbolism mm. of Obama. Okay, it just it. kept going. These guys, these voices and women just kept going like, no, this is not wrong. Then Joe Rogan was like, no, nah, I'm going to give these guys a platform. And Joe Rogan's he'll tell you he's more on the left. He'll say it. I mean, he's a Bernie, bro. But it's like he was like, nah, I'm, these guys are making sense, bro. And so what's starting to happen now is we get the double back of the people that was like, yo, bro, I was a little nervous in the beginning. But like, yo, I was listening to you. It's no different than when someone's anti-gun and then they get robbed at gunpoint. And then they're like, yo, bro, like, what was you saying about guns again? And we just accept these people with open arms. It's like the Rick James on Dave Chappelle. It's like, (laughs) I've been over here the whole time. My grandmother used to say, respect the devil. I say this all the time. When you think you're smart, the devil is ancient. Everything that you think you're coming up with, that ancient energy has probably already seen it before. Mm. And your ego will make you think you're smarter than the devil. You're smart, but the devil is ancient. Respect the devil. And when you're not that way and you don't respect the power of the mainstream narrative and their most effective devil in America, media, when you don't respect it, you don't understand how people could get caught in that, that siren. Yeah, yeah. That far down the, yeah, there's just that critical mass starts to go and it looks like it's burning wild. Oh, so when control. you understand that, you go, oh, you caught up in the matrix for a little bit. It's cool. Yeah. We, we here for you when you wake up. Yeah. When you spin out the other side. Yeah. We here for you. You're exhausted, broken, and, you know, just emotionally spent. Yeah. I'll, I'll be here. I'm here. And we have to have, and that's, that's what's happening with me with a lot of these conversations. And that's how we're able to make such headway with Black Guns Matter. Because we just like, yo, bro, come to the class if you're a felon. I don't care. Come get the knowledge. Come to the class if you're afraid of guns. I don't care. I'll show you something about bear spray. Come to the class if, if, if you're anti-gun. Tell me why. Tell me why you trust the government that much. And they're like, I don't trust the government. I'm like, well, you only want them to have the guns. So because I want to aspire to be that trusting of maybe, you know, something that I don't. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Enlighten me. Enlighten me. Yeah. Hey, I truly yo, man, I don't get to have many conversations like this that are a two way street of dialogue and 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 like camaraderie. You know what I'm saying? So I want to tremendously say thank you for that, man, because a lot of times I do media is hostile. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Yeah, man, I appreciate you being on for exactly the same reason. That's why I was so excited to have you on here. Uh, I feel so blessed that this worked out the way it did and that you made you agreed to be on. I mean, there's the the message to me is exactly what I thought it would be, but better. Uh, There's so much more depth now that I've had we've been able to do this. And I mean, I could go on for hours with you. I really feel like we could sit and do this forever. And I got it. I respect your time. And so in doing that and be making sure I'm being really respectful for people that want to find out more about you, black guns matter, uh, the, the solutionary center that you're working with and all of those things, what is the best way to, to keep in touch with you and, and, uh, keep up to date? Yeah, um, I'm on so uh, and my Instagram is Big Daddy Two Ray B I G D A D D Y T O U R E. Um, follow me there. I keep getting <laughs> Instagram keeps like knocking yeah. my pages off, so I'm trying to uh, rebuild that one. I'll keep following you. I'll keep following you. Um, the website for everyone to learn about the classes, the free classes that we give, not only in Philadelphia but across the country, that's SolutionaryLifestyle.org. Um, keep abreast there. Email us, um, solutionary lifestyle at gmail.com. And outside of just that stuff too, I want to interject this part email. Cause I read those emails, a lot of them myself as well. If you're going through something, man, there's dozens, I think it's 22 vets committing suicide fairly mm-hmm. regularly, man. And uh, if you're going through something, you, you, you fought for this, for our nation, you would maybe, maybe have sold, been sold the bill of goods that you saw that, I don't know. And I know you want to protect the American people, but you saw some things and you came home and you're going through something, man, if you're hearing this or, you know, males or females, just email me, man. I'll send you my phone number. Like, I'd rather hear, you know, you, the issues that you're going through than like fucking read your obituary. Yeah, man. You know? I, so like, you know, email us if you're going through stuff. If you want to teach a class at the center, 
you want to chop it up, follow me there. Um, if you've heard anything and like, even if you're like one of those rich dudes that listens to this podcast, man, you want it. We got like 470,000 more dollars to raise. One of you rich dudes, like one of uh, like Grant Cardone or one of you dudes is listening to this fucking Andy from whoever, like, you know what I'm saying? Um, if you guys want to donate a bigger number and we can work something out, please. Cause like, it's super hard to fundraise while you're doing these classes. Or even if you just like, yo, I want to donate 10 bucks, 20 bucks, a hundred bucks, man, go to givesendgo.com forward slash solutionary. And lastly, man, let's, let's just really during this, these very trying times, remember that the state is the problem. It is not other Americans. They are crafty with their media to make it look like those Americans that have been brainwashed, right? That are telling people that you're brainwashed, that are, you know, maybe brainwashing us all. Um, those people are creating the Tower of Babel. Try to give your, own, your, your people, humanity, uh, the American people, a little more grace, man. We, we, you know, gas prices are fucking insane, bro. People are like, they're hurting. Let's be kind to each other. And let's give each other a little more grace, man. You know, it's just times when you was fucking angry and somebody gave you some grace. So like, let's, let's pay that forward. And uh, let's just keep supporting people who's doing the work. My sponsors, Brownells, my sponsors, Phoenix Ammo. I'm not sponsored by Firearms Policy Coalition, but I think y'all should rock with those dudes. They're doing a lot of work. Gun Owners of, of America is doing a lot of work. If you're a member of the NRA, Please make sure that you're voting to course correct the NRA. It's a very it's America's oldest civil rights organization, but you know we got to course correct a bit. Um, and again, y'all, just just be just be cool, man. Be cool humans, you know. And uh, get some merch, blackgunsmattershop.com. Do all of that other stuff. And I, I appreciate you all, and I thank you for lit having me this uh, this these last few hours, my brother. Thank, thank you. My, thank you, man. Thanks for the message. I appreciate you. And uh, I look forward to talking to you again soon, man. I'm going to come out there and visit you guys in Philadelphia. I can't I can't hang up this thing and not try to get it, get out there. See you dudes. We get some shooting done. Come through. Done. I, I got a crazy concept. I'm going to try to teach a firearms class in Independence Hall where the Constitution was signed. Oh, sign sign me up, man! I'm American history buff and and a two, and a two a pro two A dude. I'm there in a heartbeat. For yeah. sure. Right, right on, man. All right. Peace. Thanks, Thanks Josh. Josh.